Hey guys, today is Wednesday, March 28th, 2018. And more importantly, today lands smack dab in the middle of Holy Week. Holy Week is, for followers of Jesus, one of the most important times of the year. The last week of Jesus' life before the cross is commemorated during this week, during this time. Palm Sunday was just a few days ago, and Easter Sunday is almost here. A number of years ago, a friend shared with me that Wednesday of Holy Week, today, is known as Spy Wednesday. Ooh, sounds mysterious, doesn't it? I asked him, I said, what is Spy Wednesday? Never heard of this. Now, I knew about Monday Thursday. That was the night of the Last Supper, the time when Jesus washed his disciples' feet and shared a meal with them. I had grown up with Good Friday. I knew what that was. My family would often attend a service at church. I had learned a little bit more about Vigil Saturday, although I never really observed or had gone to a vigil service. And of course, Easter Sunday was always the biggest day of the year growing up in the church. But Spy Wednesday? What is that about? To be honest, it sounded kind of dastardly. Spy Wednesday is the night when it's believed that Judas made the final arrangements for handing Jesus over for betrayal. The Gospel of Matthew records this in chapter 26, verses 14 and 16. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. Thirty pieces of silver. A betrayal. A betrayal sealed with a kiss. What was Judas all about? You know, there's several different theories as to why Judas went and why he betrayed Jesus. One theory is that Judas was mad at Jesus. The preceding narrative in Matthew and Mark are all about Jesus being anointed at Bethany by a woman, and she dumps expensive perfume all over Jesus. We're told that the disciples were upset at the cost of the perfume. And some of them said, oh, this might have been sold and the money given to the poor. And with Judas in charge of the money bag, from which he was known to pilfer a little bit, it's highly likely that he was one of the disciples complaining about the seeming misuse of the perfume. Another theory is that Judas, as a member of a more revolutionary group, his desire was for Jesus to lead a political overthrow of the Roman government. And maybe Judas had followed Jesus for these reasons, and he's been kind of disappointed thus far, and Jesus' failure to take advantage of the cheering crowds when he entered into the city of Jerusalem. So, maybe Judas in that way is trying to get back at Jesus somehow. Finally, some scholars think that maybe Judas didn't intend for things to go as far as they did. That maybe Judas really believed in Jesus, really believed in his power, and he was just trying to force Jesus' hand to reveal himself or to use his power to advance a physical or political kingdom. What is sad is this, Judas, unlike Peter or unlike the other disciples, even though he demonstrates remorse for his betrayal, he's seemingly unable to receive God's grace and forgiveness. We read later on in Matthew 27, verses 3 and 5, When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said. For I betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Friends, we mustn't give up hope that we can be saved. We mustn't give up hope that we can be redeemed. Judas was remorseful for his betrayal, but he could not receive the gift of God's grace for his life. I've often tried to imagine what Jesus might have said to Judas had he only run away and returned to the disciples on Resurrection Sunday. You know, Jesus restored Peter, who had denied him three times. Could he not have done the same for Judas? I recall a story one time many years ago when I was a pretty new chaplain with the team. A particular player had seemed to be in the coach's doghouse for so long. And then, one day, the assistant coach waves the player over and told him to take his substitute bib off. The coach later confided in me. He said, Rev, when he came over to me, I could tell from his face that he was dejected and he wasn't going to make any difference whatsoever in the game. See, that player had lost all hope of the coach ever playing him or utilizing him. And by the time the coach came around to him, he was lost. His heart, his motivation, 
his desire for the game, for playing, they were gone. And the coach knew it immediately. I think of that story, and I imagine this is probably how Judas felt. Just a sense of utter despondency that there really was no hope for him. But there is hope for us. You know, the Apostle Paul put it this way. He said this in 1 Timothy 1.15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Man, if the Apostle Paul could say that he's the worst of sinners, where does that put you? Where does that put me? (laughs) I don't know that I rank way up there, but for whatever it's worth. This Wednesday, this Spy Wednesday, I want to leave you with a 15th century Irish prayer. And it's my hope that in this prayer, you will realize that there's hope. That Jesus has come to transform us, to forgive us, to change our our lives in such a powerful way. And it's a work that only He can do. Here's the prayer. O Son of God, do a miracle for me and change my heart. Thy having taken flesh to redeem me was more difficult than to transform my wickedness. This is the Rev coming to you from the Touchline.